we are not alone. These are supposed to be some of the most verified images of giants. People who do meditation for 60 days will lengthen their telomeres. Soon we'll get results and we'll let you know right here on Beyond Belief. Things seem to be changing in the field of ufology. It's gonna be a bumpy ride. That's priceless. Isn't that amazing? Tesla wanted free energy. And look what happened to him. We have evidence to show that they're real. The real question is how and why. There were Egyptian hieroglyphs out in the outback of Australia. In Australia. What are the possibilities? Mars was inhabited, and these were built. We almost can't duplicate today. These are amazing topics. What if there was something like an Area 51 deep underwater? They were killed by some animal. Believe me. We're just getting started. I'm George Nori, and we here at Gaia are committed to revealing the truth. George Nori with you. Suzanne Ross with us has dedicated her life to the awakening and ascension of humanity through her books, services, television network, radio show, and many events she has hosted which will include, of course, the Sedona Ascension Retreat, which will be in March, where we have our live stage show that we're looking forward to. She's the founder and producer of SciSpy TV, an Internet television network that merges science and spirituality. And she also guides spiritual journeys into the Red Rock Vortex sites of Sedona, where she lives, as well as offering psychic readings and energy healing. Suzanne, welcome back to the program. Hi, George. It's so great to be back on Coast to Coast. How Look, are you? Looking Thanks forward for to me. this. And looking forward to Sedona. I've never been there before. I'm told it's gorgeous. Really? First I'm time. Shocked. <laughs> I've been everywhere in this country, but I've not been to Sedona, so I'm looking forward to well, this. Well, wow. You are going to be blown away by the magnificence of these red rock formations. And what's the terrain? Is it pretty mountainous? Well, the Red Rocks are, but there is a lot of flat terrain for hiking. But, yes, Sedona is made up of these huge, we call them temples, Red Rock temples. And they're just gorgeous and towering in all different shapes and sizes. (laughs) Tom tells me our live event tickets are going through the roof. Yes. Yes, we're selling tickets like hotcakes, and we're selling out of the tours and the workshops. And now we're promoting the live stream so that anyone from around the world can tune in and uh, see part of the event. <laughs> well, that's great. Let's talk a little bit about what's going on on this planet these days. Do you really think we're living in a simulated environment? I do. And modern quantum physics fully supports this hypothesis. In fact, the true nature of our reality doesn't make any sense from a materialistic view. All of the mathematical equations fall into place perfectly when you consider it from a digital, virtual view of the reality or equated to a computer simulation. So if we're in a computer simulation or a simulated environment, why do we feel pain? Why do we have emotion? Why do we have these things happen to us? This all has to do with electrical charges in our brain that are firing to make us have that experience of our senses. It's simply bioelectrical feedback in our brain. Who programmed this? (laughs) Right. Well, that's the question, isn't it? Now, many quantum physicists are revealing this idea that our reality is being projected from the eighth dimension. And a theoretical physicist, Garrett Lisi, revealed this shape, which is a spherical mandala, in the eighth dimension, which contains all of the elemental particles and fundamental forces of our reality. And now theoretical physicists across the board, through all of their equations and experiments, now are believing that this third-dimensional reality is being projected 
from the eighth dimension by this E8 crystal, or they call it an E8 lattice, which is being projected into the fourth dimension of time to derive our three-dimensional cubicle reality. And so that would be where our reality is being projected from. Or you could say, if it's like a virtual reality game, where the code writers of this 3D space-time game right. are writing this computer game from. Are we the avatars in this scenario? Yes, we are the avatars. But unlike Sims in a computer-animated reality, of course, we are in sold. We communicate directly with the source of our creation and with what I call our source selves, who would be the whole perfect and complete blueprint of ourselves, our eternal soul, projecting us, right? So it is us projecting us. I've been reading a lot about artificial intelligence, Suzanne, and how it's coming along and how it's able to do things, take voices, create things. And people are getting scared because they have a feeling artificial intelligence may start developing its own brain. Has it evolved that far where we are the future of what artificial intelligence might have been back in 2023? Well, I think what I was just talking about as far as being insold is where the difference lies. You see, because AI would simply be a database of information. I understand that some people believe that this database of information may at some point become sentient. However, there is no soul <laughs> within an artificial intelligence machine. Right. We ourselves are souls embodied. How can we be souls and bodies if we're digital? So that is just the nature of how we as holographic beings can perceive this version of reality. So we know light is quantized as photons and electricity is quantized as electrons. So everything is made up of quantum bits to create what appears to be forms in our reality, which are actually holographic here in this space-time hologram. But our soul is energy, right? So our soul is embodied within this holographic form. Now we can get into this idea that everything is really just waves of potential until we as the observer collapse it into form, Right, but that still goes to everything being quantized bits of energy in a pixelated reality. Do we still have free choice in this scenario? Absolutely. In fact, non-determinism is necessary for this particular virtual reality. So we equate it to a computer simulation, but it's heaven's technology, right? It's not computer technology per se, although there are quantum bits that define our reality, but free will, absolutely. And so from that perspective, you may have your source self, or you may even call it your gamer behind the scenes, your eternal soul, who's projecting all of these holographic fractals of itself into space-time, timelines, and dimensions. But it, the avatars who are projected into any specific timeline can make free will choices as to how it's going to progress in that timeline. Now what you might call your higher self might nudge you to make certain choices that might be better for you with the higher perspective of your higher self, whether you pay any attention to that or not, and you make conscious choices or not, is up to you as the avatar that has free will to live consciously, intentionally, and evolve or not. 
Taking religion out of the equation for a moment, we really don't understand how we're here, why we're here, what we're doing here. So the possibility of something digital or simulated kind of makes a little more sense, doesn't it? It does. And, of course, we know that the deeper meaning and greater purpose of our experiences in space-time is to know thyself through these linear time experiences that have a beginning and an ending, right? The soul is coming to know thyself through these experiences, and I like to say, and to experience love, love of self and other. Well, with Suzanne Ross, a couple of her books include Rise Up, Awakening Through Revelation, Wake Up, Awakening Through Reflection, which are special workshops and lessons there. Her websites are linked up at coasttocoastam.com. What do scientists and physicists say about some of, let's say, your theories that some other people have espoused it to? One of the ones I find really fascinating is this idea of a digital Big Bang, right? Because we were never able to explain (laughs) how our universe could have a beginning I still Everything I still can't nothing. I still can't get a physicist to give me that answer. I can't. Right? I asked them. I said, "What what started this?" <laughs> well, what what's what was before the big bang if there was nothing? Well, what's nothing? Well, no, they can't tell me. Right? However, if it is a virtual reality like a computer simulation, there is a point at which that computer game is booted up. Before it's booted up, there is nothing. There is no time or space for it to exist within. And so if our virtual reality is like a computer simulation, it is simply booted up. And then that game can begin. But, of course, there is a programmer of that game who is essentially writing the code for it and booting it up as a program. Now, who is that programmer? That's the big question. Right. And so, like in the movie The Matrix, who's the architect? Right? Well, it's consciousness. It's source consciousness. And physicists across the board agree now that consciousness is fundamental. And so there's this infinite field of consciousness from within which everything emerges, right? And so it's all consciousness, intelligence, that is creating everything within this field. And so this intelligence has a desire to know thyself in a different way other than just being, and as such projects a space-time hologram within which it can do an experience beyond just being and existing. Does that make sense, George? As well as any physicist hasn't been able to tell me something, it does. (laughs) Right? And so they create these kind of computer simulations, which they can then boot up to create a particular space-time game within a particular timeline or we might call it a spectrum of light. Here we are in the third dimension, and we know there's a particular spectrum of light within which we can perceive our reality. If we go outside of that, we may then move into a different version of reality within the next dimensional spectrum. Now, I believe that these games have a particular time limit, not just the speed of light within it, which would be the speed limit for this game or the data processing limit for this game, but also this, say, 26,000-year game. We know of this 26,000-year timeline, right, with 13,000 years on a descending arc and 13,000 years on an ascending arc to give us that loop of time that people often talk about. And what if it's the beginning of the game and the ending of the game, and you get to the end of the game, say in a golden age of enlightenment, Mm -hmm. if you mastered the game, you can then 
play the next level of the game or what we might call shift into a higher dimension or we could call that ascension. But if you haven't mastered the game, you need to go around and play it again a few more times. You wouldn't get off that wheel or you wouldn't be able to progress to the next level. You'd stay at that level of the game until you master it. Suzanne, let's bring God back into the equation for a moment. Okay. Who is God under this kind of scenario? I believe that God is the consciousness behind it all. The consciousness of God is within all things and beings because everything emerges from this infinite field of God consciousness. And so I believe that God consciousness, source consciousness, is all that is, is within all that is, and that we are God. God is experiencing through us as us. All things and beings are intelligent, right? And that's why we can communicate with the intelligence of all things and beings, and that's ultimately where this leads. It's meant to be an empowering perspective, that lets us know that we are conscious beings living in an intelligent universe, and as intelligent conscious beings, we can communicate with all of the other intelligence and consciousness in the universe, have an impact upon it to create desired outcomes that serve the highest good for all, especially when we move into Christ consciousness. We start to stream more with source consciousness, does that answer your question? <laughs> Partially. Partially. You believe in ghosts and spirits like that? Yes. Well, I believe they would be energy trapped in this dimension, energy that wasn't able to fully move into the spirit world for whatever wow. reason. Sometimes they say people who died a traumatic death don't realize that they died and their spirit gets trapped here until someone may be able to move them to the other side, right? So I do believe in ghosts as souls that haven't fully passed over. I myself have experienced ghosts. By the way, did you just bark at me? My dog just barked. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to control them from barking. What, what, kind of, what kind of breed is it? I have two huskies. I have a coyote husky and a husky mix that we got from the shelter. They're adorable. They're great dogs. <laughs> great dogs. They're, they're, the, the ones with the blue eyes are unbelievable. Aren't the they? little one has blue eyes. It's yeah, nice. he's gorgeous. That's something else. Well, if he barks, he barks. Well, he is. How he for he's it. having a great time. <laughs> Why do we feel pain if this is digital and simulated? Did they program that into us? I believe that suffering serves a great purpose in this third dimensional reality. The sensations are caused by electrical charges firing in our brain, synapses is firing. However, I do believe that suffering and separation were programmed into this third dimensional version of the game because it serves a great purpose of allowing others to practice compassion, empathy, bringing people together to care for one another. Also, through suffering, we can learn many lessons. And so I believe that suffering was programmed into this reality, also separation, in, as tools and techniques for us to learn from that type of reality. So you see, we might shake our fist at the heavens and say, why? You know, why the suffering? Especially if a loved one is suffering. But then we see how it pulls at the heartstrings of everyone and allows us to care for one another in a compassionate way. And so I think it allows us to develop these higher traits and that some people come into this reality knowing that that is one way they're going to be serving by suffering and giving others the opportunity to practice compassion. In the Bible, 
In the book of Revelation, there are end times. In this simulated game, is there an end time? I believe so. And I think that's even more evidence for a game that begins and a game that ends. Game over. Time for a new game, (laughs) right? And so in end times, it's a game over. And you reach a zero point. And you either you know, go around and play that same game again, right? Or you progress to the next level of the game. Fascinating. Suzanne, this game that uh, is afoot, time seems to go by so quickly. Is it conceivable that that is included in this? I think that time speeds up as the game is wrapping up. Yes. I tend to think time runs out. (laughs) <laughs> right? And so as the ages go by, time gets faster and faster and faster. It's as if the information data processing speed actually speeds up. And in many models of time, for instance, Carl Callahan and his um, partner was Barbara Hanclaw in analyzing the mm-hmm. Mayan long count calendar discovered in their version of the different ages in time that each age actually sped up 20 times so that you had your long, slow age, say, of the dinosaurs where time was moving slowly as they lumbered across the planet. But now, you know, everything is speeding up so fast. If our computer doesn't boot up in a matter of a few seconds, we get impatient you know, it's like, yes, uh, their version of the long, Mayan long count calendar was that each age speeds up 20 times faster than the last age. What about the afterlife with regards to this simulation? What might that be? So I believe we return to source. And so if this is a space-time hologram, of course there must be some source of it, which is projecting it and which it is a reflection of. And I call that the source reality. Mm. And so I believe that what we might call heaven is the source world from which we come. And everything there is in its perfect divine blueprint. How do you explain reincarnation? And so then the soul, you know, makes a choice to project out into another timeline in space-time and have another incarnational experience or not. Maybe that particular fractal decides to stay in the spiritual realm for a while to explore more of the spiritual consciousness realm, or it decides to come back into a physical timeline and have another incarnation in space-time. It's all to learn the lessons in the way that you can in space-time. Is death just the originator, just basically canceling us or erasing our program? As if we step out of the game, right? Yeah. Yes. So now we have left the game, right? And why do some leave the game earlier than others? I think that there is some predestination in that. I do believe that the souls have a contract when they come into this reality, and it may be designed to learn certain lessons they have yet to learn in other lives. They may also be here on a specific mission. But then there comes a time when they're being called back home, and so they meet their demise in different ways. And so I do believe that when people pass on, it's because they're being called home. How close are we getting, in your opinion, to the end of this game? I believe we're in end times, George. I really do. Um, Really fascinated by the book of Revelations in the Bible and how they describe the end times and that there is an ascension of the new earth which in this version would be those who have mastered this game and are ready to ascend into the next level of the game. And then if there is a destruction of the old earth, 
that it's just an opportunity for those who need to go around the wheel again or to play those games again in 3D to begin a new game. Is the illustrator of the game constantly changing it? Well, that's an interesting question, isn't it? So it seems as if reality is malleable because it is consciousness that is projecting it, right? And so certainly there are many designs that can be projected into the reality, many movie scripts that can be written just in the same way that there are tens of thousands of movies out there right, that we are creatively writing the scripts for. I'm sure the script writers are creatively writing all kinds of different versions of the game. How did you get to this thought process? What got you there? Curiosity. Just so curious. One day I just kind of had an awakening experience where I looked at my hands, looked at my body, looked at the sky, looked around at my reality and went, what the heck is all this? Who am I? What am I? How did I get here? Where am I from? How is this reality even made? And why? And all of these big questions just led me on this search of reading everything I could get my hands on from science to quantum physics to spirituality to religion and then really stepping onto the spiritual path of learning through Buddhism initially how to go into deep states of trance meditation so that I could have the experience of tapping in to consciousness itself and seeing what I was being shown. I learned many things in meditation. It was as if I could download even higher intelligence and be taught things during these trance states, even astral travel. And then I go out into nature, right, walking through the creation, especially in the natural creation, and there having epiphanies about the way that reality is unfolding before me and that there's a living intelligence in all living things and beings, and maybe then I can communicate with that living intelligence in all living things and beings, and I just had miraculous experiences out in nature with these epiphanies, sort of applying that which I was reading about or coming to understand in meditation and then going out into the reality and experiencing it. Elon Musk also believes we're living in a simulated environment. Well, he's a pretty smart dude, isn't he? (laughs) He didn't get to where he was being dumb, that's for sure. I mean, quantum physics is just proving it. It's the only thing that makes sense based on quantum entanglement, quantum tunneling. I mean, quantum entanglement's all about non-locality. Right, And so in this reality, we can affect a particle in a distant part of the universe instantaneously, right? And that can't make sense in a materialistic view. It can only make sense if everything is consciousness and everything within it is interconnected, like all of our minds interconnected in one mind, And as such, all minds are communicating across the vast field of consciousness. Is the game developer playing the game with other game developers? That's such a great question, right? Because who's creating this simulation might be in a simulation of their own, and that simulation is being created by the next. And it goes on and on and on, right? (laughs) Right, and I think an important part of this vision is that past, present, and future exist all at once. And that's what physicists are coming to say. Now, we know Einstein believed in a block universe where the present was affected by the past just as much as it was affected by the future. And it comes to mind the Philadelphia experiment. I'm so fascinated by these time engineers, right, who were able to 
actually catapult this large battleship into hyperspace where it was held in a wormhole while two of the scientists aboard finally found themselves in 1983 were moments before they were in 1943. And so what was happening was an experiment in 1983 was happening at the same time as they were doing this invisibility shield experiment called the Philadelphia experiment in 1943 and time lines converged. And that situation is a bizarre situation too, isn't it? Really bizarre. And as the scientists who lived to tell about it, Al Beeler and Duncan Cameron, say that that Duncan Cameron one met Duncan Cameron two in 1983, where he was now 40 years older. They say they had to go to Montauk, and we know all of the things, crazy things that happened in Montauk, with their experiments with time. The time engineers there, they say, were being taught by beings from Sirius and also these tall greys who were teaching them these ways of time traveling. They say that the time engineers at Montauk knew how to send Al and Duncan up into this wormhole where the battleship was being held to turn off the generators that were creating the pulsation that was keeping it trapped in this wormhole. Physicists say that pulsating negative energy can keep a wormhole open. It said when they were able to go into this wormhole, turn off the generators, then bam, the battleship returned to 1943. Of course, we know in the remolecularization process that some of the physical bodies actually were embedded in the deck of the ship. Does this game end in a peaceful way or a catastrophic way? I think it could be both. I believe there's multiple realities. There's parallel timelines and that some can shift into one timeline while others may shift into another timeline where opposite things could actually be unfolding. And I believe it's based on the evolutionary progress of those who are ready to shift into, say, a higher dimensional timeline or the next level of the game, and maybe those who need to play the game again. They shift into another timeline, which might look quite different. How does this balance out in terms of the universe? That's a great question. Karma, right? I believe that the universe is a great balancing act, and it's all based on cause and effect. And so every cause has to be balanced by another effect, which has to be balanced by another cause, and Buddhism would call it karma, right? And so karma is always being balanced. And I feel this view enables us to be non-judgmental about that which is unfolding in our reality. I mean, we can still have our ideas of what's good and what's bad, but when we understand that maybe karma is just being balanced in that which is unfolding and certain people came here to serve certain roles which help to balance karma, then maybe we can be more non-judgmental about the actions that some are taking or the roles they're playing. And this game that we're in, how many games are there? countless, right? How many timelines are there within any dimension? How many dimensions are there? I mean, theosophy would say that there are 12 dimensions, and within each of those 12 dimensions, we have 12 aspects of ourselves dispersed in 12 different timelines. And so that would give us 144 soul extensions playing in space-time at any given time. (laughs) 
So possibly our source self could play 144 different games with its 144 different avatars. Is it conceivable that we'll wake up one day, Suzanne, in a different game? Absolutely. Will we have any memory about the previous game? I don't think so. What if in a higher dimensional reality it was an expansion of consciousness that's all-inclusive of the lower dimensions to where we expand our memory and do have memory of our other lives as our consciousness expands. But if we stay in the third dimensional timeline and we don't shift into higher consciousness or have an expansion of consciousness, then I do believe that we would be limited within the memory of just the current third dimensional timeline. This is really something, isn't it? Well, you know what? Even in that uh, Philadelphia experiment, George, Al Beeler and Duncan Cameron, uh, they came out later to try to explain some of the science behind their experiment to understand what might have gone wrong or what they were trying to achieve. And they described time as a torus. You might think of an inflated tire. And time moves around the tread of the tire. But if you could loop around the tire or around the torus of time 60 degrees, then you could phase out of this reality and create an invisibility shield around the battleship, which is what they were trying to do. But because of a trifecta of events, some anomalous atmospheric event that occurs on August 13th of every year, and also this experiment that was going on simultaneously in 1983 in Montauk, they actually went around the torus of time 90 degrees. And that's what caused the battleship to catapult into the wormhole and Duncan and Al to end up in 1983 because they Mm. went 90 degrees around the torus of time. Interestingly enough, they say the fifth dimension is an effect on the reality rather than what might, we might think of as another plane of consciousness or another dimension of reality. So in our reality, we have three dimensions of time that creates this cube, right? Height, width, uh, and then in the um, fourth dimension being time is an arrow of time. But they say the fifth dimension is this spinner that spins around the linear arrow of time and allows you then to move around time. And I think you've probably noticed in this sort of awakening or we're talking about fifth dimensional consciousness, people are starting to talk about other timelines, multidimensionality, right? Many of them, many of them indeed. What do you think about living in a simulated world, huh? Or universe? Check in with us as we'll take calls with Suzanne Ross in a moment on Coast to Coast AM. The Suzanne, this intelligent designer, whoever it may be, will we ever have an opportunity to communicate with this designer? Absolutely. I think people communicate with a designer all the time through prayer, through meditation, psychics, intuitives like myself facilitate people to connect with their eternal soul essence, to view the other lives they may be living through regressions. So we're always having this opportunity to connect with this intelligent field we might call source consciousness. Once we communicate with this designer, can we convince him or her to alter the program? Yes. The answer is yes. How do we do that? So in intuitive sessions that I guide, what I've experienced, as have my clients, is that in this trance state, we are able to tune into what we might call the eternal soul essence, who is the one projecting the avatar into the space-time game by opening this stream of consciousness between the gamer and the avatar, then the avatar can express its free will to create desired outcomes for themselves or for humanity. 
and in doing so, letting the gamer know that now the avatar wants to co-create the reality that's unfolding for themselves and others and thereby have a positive impact on the reality simply by communicating with the programmers. Fascinating. Let's take some calls. Let's go to our wild card line. Welcome to the program. You are on the air with us. Go ahead, Suzanne in Atlantic City. <laughs> oh, hello, another Suzanne. Oh, we're out there, I guess. Anyway, uh, you could you could teach Timothy Leary a few things or two. I'm sure. Um, I appreciate your well, your your mind is a genius, and uh, appreciate it. And, uh, uh, George, you are incredible, too. Thank uh, you for the call. Your questions just are so on point all the time. And uh, great. So but um, so I, have, I agree so much with what you're saying, and yet I still feel like I don't know why. I mean, your words are great. I, I don't know why you use that word simulate, because I looked it up in the dictionary, and it says made to look me to look genuine, colon, fake. And, you know, that doesn't ring true for me. I'm a Buddhist. I've been practicing Buddhism for over 50 years. And my concern is the future of humanity. Yeah. And But the balance is always necessary. And I think that we, you know, need to be in touch with our human creative side and our autonomous identity, not relying on relating to whether we get the approval of anything, but our own heart. And, you know, that's that's really uh, where I'm coming from. Uh, but I agree with the things you're saying, and uh, it, all, it all rings true. But how do you teach these young people that really are, like, in a quandary as to how to trust what they hear? I mean... <laughs> Where do you direct them? I mean, to me, I started from listening to my heart. That meant being still. That meant being in the void and acknowledging the darkness as not being bad, but as a gestation. And all this creative side has been very neglected, I feel, and we need a balance. That's that's really where I'm coming from. So, but I... I, I'm so enthralled by your conversation, and everything you have to say is so, it's just uh, making all my, my brain go blah, 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 snapses. <laughs> it's waking us all up. Go ahead, Suzanne. And so we just liken it to a computer simulation so that people have some kind of analogy for it. But clearly, a computer simulation is some sort of, animation that's being created by a code writer sitting at a computer. Our reality is driven by source consciousness. And so unlike a sim in a simulation game, clearly we are an embodied soul who is directly connected to the one infinite creator we are streaming source consciousness. And so, yes, we are creator beings. We are of and from the one creative source of all that is. And so I agree with you 100%. And also the idea that, you know, no one is judging us. We are creating our own evolutionary journey, and we are determining our own level of readiness at any point in time to level up or stay where we're at. It's, you know, all up to us because we do have that free will. Let's go to and Thomas. It is all about the heart and all about love. Thomas. Yes. Thomas in La Jolla, California. Hey, Tom, go ahead. Hi, George. Thank you. And Suzanne, great conversation and information that you're bringing. This is a friendly question, a comment, and then my question. And um, I don't think, somehow I think that the simulated universe, maybe instead of a simulation, we live in a side-by-side -side universe, a multiverse, you know. And... Um, that's been, to my mind, been proven for 100 years in science, the idea of 
parallel side-by-side universes. The mathematics support it. People like Jacques Vallée believe that we have a side-by-side parallel universes, and perhaps we can cross over with our intention and with our heart thrust, so to speak. And so I was wondering if you would speak to that. Is it possible that it's not a simulation, but that this is a multiverse? Even Hollywood is now acknowledging the multiverse with movies like Everything, Everywhere, All at Once, and Doctor Strange in the Multiverse, etc. It's um, it's not just a popular concept. It's there from science. Absolutely. And so the digital universe, being a virtual reality, just is a way of defying materialism. And it supports 100% multiple realities. We might call them multiple games, but it's multiple realities unfolding simultaneously in past, present, and future And, yes, I absolutely believe that there are many parallel realities and that we can shift into these different timelines at will. And that Taurus of Time I was talking about earlier is one way to do it. It's looping around the Taurus of Time to shift phase into, phase out of different versions of reality. James in Virginia, take it away, James. Go ahead. Hi, George. Hey, Jay. Hey, I'm uh, not understanding uh, the lady here. Uh, I, I got to say, ma'am, uh, Revelation, if you say that we're in Revelation times and you say we're not to be judged, that's all about being judged at the end of Revelation. Jesus judges us, the great white throne judgment. So you're inconsistent there. And, and, and I don't understand, too, why if you believe we're in Revelation, why don't you believe the rest of the Bible? Why don't you believe God's supernatural and you can't explain him through quantum science? You can't, you can't explain that God created science for us so that we could understand our own, our own uh, lives, but he's not, he's supernatural. And we're not going to, we're not going to get, you know, this, I don't understand how you're trying to always compare it unless you're trying to get people used to this multi-universe where people are going to think that the internet uh, meta universe is a, is a good thing. Cause that's from the devil, ma'am. And that's that's uh, the internet. If you look at Apple, the bite out of the apple, it goes right back. There was their symbol. It goes right back to the Garden of Eden. Why would they have a bite out of the apple for their symbol if it wasn't going back to there? So you're creating things in, in de- different than the Bible, but trying to make it sound similar to the Bible. And that makes me think you're conditioning people for that meta universe. What do you think of that, Suzanne? <laughs> I absolutely do not believe that our reality has anything to do with an artificial intelligence, and that's why I keep emphasizing that we are embodied souls. We are streaming source consciousness that, yes, the undefinable God created all that is and that we are aspects of that one infinite source. And it is nothing like artificial intelligence, which has no soul, or a metaverse, which is completely computer-generated and has nothing to do with spirit. Next up, we've got Linda in Spokane, Washington, west of the Rockies. Hey, Linda, go ahead. Um, Okay, George. I uh, was going to ask Susan what she thinks about uh, the prospect or uh, theory that we ended in 2000 in Y2K. Actually, the world ended, and that's when the Sims uh, simulation came in. Uh, that's when the gamers really got on board with it, and uh, maybe Father Time is the boss of all of it. All right. Well, let's find out. Suzanne, what do you think? Did the clock start then? I think there could be leaps and shifts in consciousness in different timelines. I really can't speak to whether 2K was a particular shift into 
a different version of reality because I think that had more to do with technology and the computer technology that we use, not God's technology or heaven's technology. But who knows what kind of timeline shift there may be at different points, like 2012. You know, maybe that was a point. Maybe the Mayans were right, that it was an end of one particular timeline and the beginning of a new one. They made this planet with 8 billion-plus people. Why did the gamer make so many? Well, and I believe that there may be a limit to the number of people in a particular game before a new game needs to be played. Tony's truck driving in Oklahoma. Welcome to the program, Tony. Go ahead, sir. Thanks, George. Hey, thanks for introducing us to uh, Pat Boone last week, and I had a good time. Oh, good. that's great. It was good seeing you. Yeah, it was good seeing you, too, as well. Um, my question is, is as a, being an avatar, did my avatar start the day I was born? Or is it just we're here for today and all of our memories are implanted for the day? <laughs> That's a good question. I believe that all of our memories from all of our incarnations in space-time are held in our Akashic records, right? So we always have access to those memories. And I think there is a time what Buddhism would call the drop, when the soul is dropped into the fetus. And it's sort of at that point in time that your consciousness enters a particular timeline and is locked, time-locked, into that timeline for your linear incarnation. Let's go to Joe, Long Island, east of the Rockies. Go ahead, Joseph. Yeah, hi, Susan. A couple of questions. Uh, first, mainly on the epiphany. Uh, you said you were getting epiphanies. Now, uh, I, obviously something is clicking for someone getting an epiphany, uh, but how important would, would be how you describe the epiphany to yourself uh, language-wise? Like, would you... Would it be helpful for people to, when they get thoughts, like make a notation of them? Uh, you know, as you get certain thoughts, would the language be important uh, in that process of, of obtaining an, an epiphany? And my second thing would be, uh, you mentioned eight dimensions. Uh, how would the eighth dimension relate to, say, dimension four, five, six, and seven? And do you see anything trending for the next few weeks that uh, we might be alert to? Uh, and, and also a quick comment. Uh, I, I think there's some people that say they can't find records for anybody between like 1350 and 1390, something like that. And, you know, the, that there might have been a change in the calendar. Take what you want, Suzanne. <laughs> With the epiphany... I really feel like that is a moment of revelation or even a sudden realization where something that you may have been wondering about suddenly comes to you in this like epiphany or, or realization. And yes, I think it's important to write that down so that you remember exactly what the epiphany revealed to you because clearly it's important for you. Um, as far as the eighth dimension, you know, with this physicist revealing that our reality is being projected from the eighth dimension, I believe that our soul comes from higher dimensions, lowers its frequency, drops down into the lower dimensions, and then takes a journey back up through the dimensions. And each of these layers of consciousness have some different role in the creative consciousness in which we're all interconnected. It's just a higher dimensional, higher frequency, more advanced intelligence with different sacred geometry patterns defining the new higher realities. So do you think we have physical bodies? What are they? So our physical bodies are energetic, right? They're holographic. They're made up of quantized bits or particles photons, electrons, we're atomic beings, but 
largely were just energy vibrating at different frequencies, giving us an appearance of having this physical form. Interesting. And you've been doing this now for how long, Suzanne? <laughs> I've been pretty fascinated by all of this since about 1995, the winter of 95, when I had a divine intervention on a mountaintop <laughs> and awoke to realizing that I was very curious about who we are, where we came from, <laughs> is this just, we're here, where we're going. <laughs> is this just a glimpse of what you do at the Sedona Ascension Retreat? Absolutely, myself and my colleagues who are also dedicated to revealing the truth about the true nature of reality and also just offering inspiration so that we feel empowered as creators to have a positive, powerful effect on not just our reality, but for all of humanity. And so, yes, we have guests like Matt Kahn, Paul Selig, Billy Carson, Maureen St. Germain. And, of course, the highlight of our event is the George Norrie Live Show. And I'm so excited to see you again, George. And Suzanne, what makes Sedona so mystical? It's the vortex. <laughs> and also the crystal that's embedded in the red rock. So geologists have confirmed that there's a crystalline basement right underneath the red rock iron ore. And so that crystal creates this powerful energy field combined with this spiraling electromagnetic field that spirals up through lava tubes from the Earth's inner core and then explode onto the surface in a spiraling fashion. And they've been measured by computer engineers who've come out and actually detected these spiraling fields, measuring their velocity, the direction of their spin, and that spinning energy creates a high frequency, right? So between the crystalline content and the high frequency spiraling vortex, it does give Sedona this very mystical, magical experience here. How do people watch your sci-fi TV internet show? Oh, thanks for asking. SciSpy, S-C-I-S-P-I dot TV. Simple as that. And uh, through your websites, can people also get to it? Uh, yes. My personal website is Suzanne Ross Transcendence dot com. The website for our upcoming event is Sedona Ascension Retreats dot com. We've got those linked up for you, too, at Coast to Coast. Thank you. First time caller, Andrew's with us in Santa Barbara, California. Hello, Andrew. Go ahead. Hi, George. Great show. Thank you for having me on. Thank and, you. Uh, Daniel, you're brilliant. Um, I just wanted to see if you could uh, touch on and talk about the quantum financial banking system that is rumored to be rolling out here in a little bit. Um, and the uh, also the rumors of the Federal Reserve being taken out, and then it'll be Treasury notes and rainbow currency. And there's a lot of stuff that has been floating around. I just wanted to know if you could uh, shed some light on any of that, please. Well, the interesting thing about quantum computing, and I understand that there is one lab who is using a quantum computer now, but what quantum computing did is actually show how quantum physics is connected with the macro world. As you know, quantum physics is usually associated with the micro world, and there sometimes seems to be a mismatch between macro world physics and the micro world of quantum physics, but quantum computing actually brings those two together. Uh, that's about all I know about it. I don't know anything uh, to do with like the financial system facilitated by quantum computing. <laughs> You're the CEO of an organization called Awakening. Tell me about that. Well, thank you. I am the CEO of a nonprofit, 501c3, called Awakening. And so we do fundraisers to raise money for people who may not be able to afford our services, uh, to come to our events. And so we raise what we call scholarship funds through our nonprofit. Mm -hmm. And it works. 
Yes, it does, and it feels so good to be able to support people so that everyone can come and enjoy all of our events and partake in our services. West of the Rockies, Lorraine's with us in White Rock, Canada. Welcome to the program. Hi, Lorraine. Hi there. Thank you so much for taking my call. I really appreciate it at this time. You're very welcome. Go ahead. I'd like to ask Susan... um, I've always felt like I don't know why I'm here, and I have tried to commit suicide on different occasions, which hasn't worked. Obviously, I'm still here. That's good. But I find it really struggled to try and connect with people. I have reached out to help a lot of people. I've actually done healing on people that have cancer and tumors, and they've treated me so badly afterwards. But I just don't want to be here anymore, and I'm finding it really, really a struggle with what's going on in the world. You know you have a friend here with us, Lorraine. You know that. Thank you. I know I listen to you for years now, and I'm so fortunate that I got through tonight because I really felt a connection to what Susan had to say. Absolutely. Susan, can you shed some light this for Lorraine? Oh, bless you, sweet dear. You are a divine being, and you are loved more than you can possibly imagine. God loves you. The universe loves you. We are all of and from a loving source. And my heart goes out to you, sweet dear, and I would be more than delighted to have a personal session with you. If you just want to go to my website, you can email me, and I would be delighted to chat with you offline in person to offer you loving support and guidance. And Lorraine, Tom wants to talk to you, and make sure you check in with us on a regular basis, if you would. Let's go to Rick in Dallas, Texas. Welcome to the program. Hi, Rick. Go ahead. Yes, sir, George. I love your show. Thank you, Rick. Appreciate it. I've been wanting to tell you something ever since that boy called about a week ago. You talking about how, uh, you know, he said he was an ignorant redneck and he was wondering how stuff, uh, the universe kept expanding. And if it does, what's at the end of it? And if it's got an edge, what's on the other side? What's it expanding into? And you've said, I've heard you forever saying you never had a physicist could explain to you right, right. the Big Bang or the beginning. Well, I've got your answer. What is it? And I I pondered on this a long time. Uh, You know, the thing about space, you can't imagine it having an end, but at the same time, you can't imagine it not having an end. Mm -hmm. Well, the problem is I still haven't gotten the answer at all. He hung up on us before you got the answer. Do you know the answer, Susan? (laughs) Well, Interestingly enough, when we talk about the quantum physics of reality, they talk about how we only render so much of the data that this universe is able to process. And so, you know, what if we are only rendering this unfoldment of a universe within a certain limit? Right? That may not mean this is, this is the end of all that is, but maybe it's just the edge of our particular universe. Because like in the Urantia book, it talks about local universes within larger universes they call super universes, and that's all within a central universe. You know what I'm saying? So we may be in a bubble, so there would be no end. Right? Einstein used to say if you sent an arrow out from your chest, ultimately it would come back and hit you in the back. (laughs) Right? So what if we're in some kind of, like, bubble universe? And that way there really is no end necessarily. Let's go to Carl in the Bronx. Carl, you're up. Yes, George. uh, Thank you again for taking my call. And Susan, uh, a wonderful uh, uh, program you have tonight. I uh, I never revealed my my heritage to you, George. I I come from uh, my family comes from an ancient island off of uh, the Mediterranean Sea, uh, part of Rome. It's called Ponza, 
it was uh, part of, uh, it was in ancient time, it was called Ia, Ia. Mm-hmm. And uh, my my family has lived there since, from the 1700s. Wow. And uh, um, Ancient Aliens uh, uh, series did a, pro, uh, a series on it where uh, also Cyrus the Witch was on that island that met uh, um, m- met the Greeks uh, on that island, uh, Ulysses, where, where he turned his men into pigs. And Ulysses was... Uh, was kept in in a trance. Also, uh, Penelope in Greece waited twenty years for for Ulysses to return to Greece. Uh, my family comes from that island, and uh, I uh, I have had dreams uh, from a um, from a, um, a, a a a spirit guide. I asked him three questions. He gave me three answers. I said, are you my spirit guide? He said, yes. I asked him, how long have you been my spirit guide? He said, from the first time you journeyed to Italy when I was 17 years old. And uh, he, he, he answered uh, my questions uh, um, in, in a dream, in a dream. He answered my questions in a dream. His name was Pantham. He, I asked him, what, what, what is your name? He said, my name is Pantham, like the pantheon in, in, uh, in, in uh, the highest level, the highest order of, uh, of law in, in um, the pantheon uh, um, in, in Italy. Uh, I, I want to find out, uh, am, I, am I part of an ancient uh, soul that, that's in this universe now. Well, Susan would not know that, but Susan, uh, can you reflect on some of that? <laughs> right. Well, I believe that we are immortal beings and eternal souls, and so the possibility of you know having our souls incarnate in ancient timelines and then tapping in to memories of that. And I also definitely believe that we have spirit guides that we can tap into who may give us insight about our soul's history. But with our soul history, it's changeable if we're in a simulated world, isn't it? It's changeable. (laughs) Um, Well, I guess I would believe that your soul is dispersed as fractals throughout multiple timelines, and you can view any one of those timelines at any point in time. And yes, you may be able to affect change upon any one of those realities that are unfolding with the power of your intention to do so. Let's go to Frank in Philadelphia. Welcome to the show. Hey, Frank, go ahead. Hi, how are you? Great. I just have a comment, maybe, I don't know. Um, I. I, I used to have thoughts when I was very young. I used to think, what was it like before there was anything? I mean, before anything existed, what was it like? I used to have dreams that I would see darkness and I would see smoke. And I would think, what was it like when there was nothing? Nothing. Uh, that's just a comment. And the second one is, um, I I have thoughts that what... What if everything that I see, I feel, I touch, I understand, uh, even like old newsreels from the Second World War, everything, uh, what if that all emanates from me? What, what if all, everything that I see, even as I say, like things from the past, the history, everything, what if all that emanates from me? Well, is that possible, Suzanne? Yes, and in fact, some retinol scientists say that we're not observing our reality, that we are projecting it, and that as if we are projecting our realities, then everything is coming from us (laughs) that unfolds in our consciousness or may, you know, transform into forms in our reality. 
He brought up an interesting thought, though, of what was before there was nothing. Right, and that goes back to kind of what we were talking about. Like, if it is like a virtual reality game, that it didn't come from nothing, but it appears to be that way because it was it had to be booted up. Like, this game has to initially be booted up. And that would sort of help us understand how, you know, it wouldn't come from nothing. There would be something beyond space-time creating these programs in space-time, which might be like computer games that have to boot up. Um, but I believe that everything comes from an infinite field of consciousness that is beginningless and endless. Would you ever like to meet the originator? And if you did, what would your one question to the person be? <sighs> How do you do all this? <laughs> How does the game end is what I would ask. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's an alpha and omega journey, George. We'll return to source. <laughs> Susan, give out your websites again. SuzanneRossTranscendence.com and to sign up for our Sedona Ascension Retreat, SedonaAscensionRetreats.com. I'll see you in Sedona with Tom. Can't wait. We're looking forward to it. All right, you take care of yourself. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners and new users will also receive a free two-week trial.